try to hear if the voice well enough. So um, let me know if anything needs to be adjusted. So the, the agenda for the meeting is to briefly tell you about Suetok and Suetok Helsinki. We will then look uh, into the nature of a hydrogen, just the principles. And we have been asked to also discuss briefly on the oxygen and the risks on the hydrogen systems related also to oxygen systems. And then we will start going more deeply in the hydrogen systems and materials. And then at the end of the presentation, we will discuss about the market specific products and technical features. The presentation is being made by myself, Pekka Vartiainen, and I have here Sami Juntunen also working as a mod moderator of the meeting. And our field engineer, Janne Rätty, has been part of the team of making the presentation for you. But let's start with the Swedish briefly. What is Swedish and Swedish Helsinki? <clears throat> so Swedish is an American company founded in 1947 by Mr. Fred Lennon, and his aim was to make the best uh, best product possible to help customers succeed and keep making it better. So 75 years we have been doing that, and we continue. And today Swedish is around two billion dollar in annual revenue. Swedish has a uh, 22 manufacturing facilities, mainly in uh, Cleveland area, uh, Ohio, USA, but also in China and like in Isle of Man. We work in 70 countries. There is uh, around 225 sales and service centers, which we as Swedish Helsinki represent here. In a global workforce, Swedish has around 6,000 associates today manufacturing and making this range of products and services, and then the sales and service center has around 4,000 associates delivering these products and services for you. Everything that Fred founded 75 years ago, we are based on the core values of the customer focus, quality, continuous improvement, innovation, and so on. And that leads directly to the vision that we have to truly understand your application and then so that we can um, act on your needs uh, with our solutions. The markets that we are serving, um, they are chemical, petrochemical, oil and gas. Uh, so like oil refining uh, would be something everybody familiarized with. Uh, semiconductor business, um, ALD tools and other semiconductor related products. Uh, clean energy is definitely the topic we are discussing today, uh, mainly on the hydrogen today, of course. But Swedish has come a long way with the CNG, LNG applications, biogases, and so on. And then there's a lots of other markets that we work with. Our product and system portfolio today is more application specific, uh, specific solutions based than in the past we were mainly on a fittings and valves manufacturing business. But today we build solutions, complete units for our customers' needs. Uh, more on the solutions for hydrogen at the end of the presentations. And to be able to <coughs> uh, produce a pro uh, product or bring a product to the market, you have to have certifications and compliances to different, um, different needs for the hydrogen, especially the EC79, uh, for example, components to be used in hydrogen vehicles is a, a key factor. Of course, we work in Europe, so pressure equipment directive PED very important for us. Switch so Helsinki, uh, we as a sales and service center, we are uh, located here in Vanta, although the name is Helsinki. There is a long history there. We are celebrating 14th year um, of, of performance this year. We also cover the countries of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, where we have a, our um, local representatives there to help you um, on those regions. And our last year's turnover was uh, uh, 8.6 million euros. We are today um, 24 people strong, and we will help you with all of your instrumentation challenges. From there, <clears throat> we jump to the key topic of the hydrogen and how we look to hydrogen uh, as a market today. So we look to four different sections of the, the, the hydrogen ecosystem, the production, the distribution, refueling, which is also more or less um, 
storaging of the gas, you know, especially the higher pressures, and then the mobility, so the usage of the, the hydrogen in the heavy duty vehicles and other um, applications. But to get there, we need to address the safety, which is the key topic of today. So there's three things that we look as a component supplier and manufacturer when it comes to the safety. So first of all, understand the materials and manufacture and build leak proof components and assemblies. Secondly, we try to share our services and our expertise with you. So when you're building uh, solutions and, and systems, <clears throat> you can rely on um, the designing and, and our help to, to be successful. And to support all of that, we can also provide you training on how to assemble things and what should be considered, which is part of today's discussions. So from there, let's look at the, the na unique nature of the hydrogen. Most of you, of course, know that the hydrogen is among the smallest molecule in nature, but that is the reason why it's really hard to contain, and, and that creates multiple challenges where we try to answer when it comes to the gas systems. So the critical considerations <clears throat> definitely are the leak tight fitting and connections. So not only the fitting, but all the connections and possible leak paths that you might have in your system, because that affects highly on the safety, as the escaping gas definitely uh, poses safety risks. And then if we're discussing, um, and we will show more about the dispensing and refueling of a gas where a, let's say, uh, most of the normal people would see the, the hydrogen be used. So that's a, a human risk. Efficiency, definitely a big piece of the hydrogen. So it takes a lot of energy to create hydrogen. So you don't want to waste the energy by just exposing the gas out from the systems. And then one of the unique nature of a hydrogen is the hydrogen embryonment. And that affects highly on the component selections and the material selections of a um, of individual components in, for example, valve or a 316 and materials so that they can really contain the hydrogen. But before we go into the hydrogen more in depth, we will look a little bit on the oxygen side of the things as that's very big piece, uh, definitely when uh, discussing of the production of the hydrogen. So electrolyzers, <clears throat> when you produce hydrogen, they also produce oxygen. And it's very important to not understand that the oxygen itself is non-flammable. Oxygen is not a fuel and it will not ignite by itself. But it's a, it is a strong oxidizer. So it makes materials more flammable and easier to ignite. So from there, oxygen fire triangle uh, provided by WHA International um, shows you that you have to maximize the compa compa compatible materials. So when selecting a um, materials, they need to uh, be specific to be used with the oxygen. For example, using certain metals and lubricants. Then you want to minimize the ignition, ignition mechanisms. So the control, um, for example, automated ball valves so that they won't create um, electric current so that it would maybe ignite anything in, in the oxygen system. And then um, utilize the best practices when handling components and the gas systems to be used in the oxygen. Uh, utilize the best practices so that there is no dirt containment or anything else decrease going into the systems. From there, we touched the materials slightly. And this is the graph showing you some of the lubricants that you should consider when, when working with oxygen systems. For example, using a Crytox 240AC as a lubricant. Uh, when you create a pipe fitting seals, remember always uh, to consider to use PTFE pipe tape in, instead of something else. And you might want to avoid all kind of a hydrocarbon oils uh, as a lubricant. Then when we Talk about the metals, 
you might want to consider use more of the um, burn resistant uh, materials such as monel brass instead of less burn resistant materials as 316 stainless steel and others. It might come as a surprise for many that the stainless steel, like a stainless steel valve, it actually burns very severely if a oxygen ignition happens in the valve. That brings us back to the hydrogen and the oxygen. So <clears throat> when we work together with hydrogen and the oxygen is uh, nearby, the hydrogen is a fuel that will burn, and the oxygen is the strong, strong oxidizer. So you want to keep those two things separately to make your systems as safe as possible. And that brings us to the hydrogen flammability. So if we look methane and propane, for example, two common gases which are used for, for burning or heating, <clears throat> The hydrogen, air, um, um, the, the, the uh, volume or, or the mixture is much more uh, broader scope than a, a methane and propane. And if you add a pure oxygen and hydrogen, the scope is even broader. So hydrogen, air, 44% to 75%, and hydrogen, oxygen, 4% to 95% mixture is flammable. The red line over there shows the optimum space of, of flame, uh, which is uh, around 30% for hydrogen air and uh, 68 or so with hydrogen oxygen. That's why you want to keep oxygen and hydrogen away from uh, each other. That brings us to the performance characteristics of the material integrity and that, what that means. It means when we speak about the stainless steel, <clears throat> there's three elements that make 316 alloys to be 316 alloys. They are nickel, they're chromium, and then there's a molybdenum, where nickel stabilizes the crystal structure of a steel, and chromium and molybdenum both uh, work to create more corrosion resistance to the material. The AST, ASTM requires 316 to have a minimum of 16% chromium and 10% of nickel. So that's an element where we as a component supplier can affect on this uh, material selection. So Swedish minimum requirement for chromium is 17% always and 12% for nickel. Always over 316 as a minimum of that level. So that helps on the embrittlement and a corrosion in the H2 systems. And that, of course, brings us to the leak type uh, integrity, which equals the quality and safety of the systems. So both oxygen and hydrogen systems can leak from uh, for a variety of reasons. So therefore, when you make a DC, um, design, you want to avoid any leaks and sealing areas. To get there, you want to eliminate the amount of uh, connection points, for example. Then there is a thing called permeation leaks. I will show more on permeation in a second, but that's something to consider when, for example, selecting a hose. However, a good design can mi mitigate the effects of the leaks. So there, there might be chances that <clears throat> the leaks will anyway be created. So permeation, what do we mean with the permeation? There is two things. Uh, you can select, for example, a hose where you have a PTFE, Teflon inner core, but depending on the pressures and the conditions, the hydrogen can come through the hose. And then you can see the bubbles here. I will take the pointer up so I can better show. You can see the bubbles on the surface of a hose. So there is a leakage from in, inside to the hose, continuous leakage, and that can create a, a issues when you uh, work in the, in the safety um, especially. Or the permission can happen through a metal, because the metals do have a, um, a structure where you have um, crystal 
elements. Maybe that's a little bit poorly explained in English, but you have holes where the hydrogen atoms can go through, and that can then <clears throat> uh, affect on the, 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 for example, the hydrogen embrittlement. This can happen, for example, in the metal diaphragm products where the metals are a, a thinner. So how can we address that as a, as a component manufacturer? Every time that you need to create a seal, you have to consider that they eliminate the continuous pore structure between the two surfaces. And this is especially happening now with the switch of uh, two ferrule fittings, because all the machine surfaces have some degree of rough, roughnesses, like a mountain. So you have a high hills and then you have a deeper alleys or valleys <clears throat> where a uh, mating these two different surfaces can make a leak path. So especially on the, uh, the, the all metal fittings, the, the surface quality of a, a front ferrule and a surface quality of a body of a fitting are critical when we are creating a um, non-leaking seals. Same happens with the valves. So depending on the sealing mechanism of the valve, we will look uh, later a little bit more deep in the sealing mechanisms in the valves. So depending <clears throat> of a valve, how good surface you have, for example, on ball valve, and what type of a material you're trying to add, add on the side of the ball valve so it doesn't leak through. We have this um, mathematic equation from the Swage of Tube Features manual that tries to explain you the surface finish importance in a tube fit. So in the image here on the left hand side, you can see the H. That's H is a distance between the valve body and a valve stem. So the larger the stem is, the higher the flow you have outside the leakage path. When we bring that same equation to a tube fitting world, you have a body of a fitting, and the age is the the um, or the age is the the distance between the body and the the front ferrule. So from there, the better the surface quality you have on a mating surfaces of a front ferrule and a body, the better the sealing integrity you have. So now we have some basic understanding. And what we do as a sales and service center when we discuss with you about everything, but especially now in the hydrogen world, we will ask you always three things. What is your pressure? What is your temperature? And what is your flow rate in the system? So now let's look a little bit on the different systems. We started to discuss about oxygen and hydrogen safety. So that's that is highly effective when we are talking about hydrogen production, electrolysis systems, PEM or alkaline systems. You always have oxygen and hydrogen, and you want to keep them separated. Now, depending of the um, electrolyzer system, you might need to consider also materials um, that they are suitable for the oxygen, but also for the lye, which might be used in the um, electrolyzers to, as an alkali. The pressures are usually less than 30 bars, so that's not in our world very difficult to contain. But then when we start looking to H2 distribution and infrastructure where the um, hydrogen is being used, so the main components are pipelines or grid balancing systems where the pressures are usually less than 100 bars. H2 storage tanks where the pressures are up to 500 bars, and then the usage might be a fuel cell where the pressures are typically much less than 30 bars. And then when we go to the H2 compression, so you have to store it somehow, and then maybe for refueling, the pressures are getting much more higher, and that brings other elements and material choices to be considered. First of all, the temperatures might be a negative Celsius up to minus 40, or then the pressure classes, so when we are speaking of the uh, hydrogen vehicles, <clears throat> there's mainly two hydrogen um, classes, which are called as H70 and H35. 
meaning the 350 bar systems for H35 or 700 bar systems for H, um, H70. So then the storage pressures are close to 1,000 bars for H70 systems and around 550 bars uh, for um, H35. And the temperatures might be, again, minus 40. That brings another element into the systems. Or then when you are discussing of the mobility side, so the vehicle, when they're moving, there is much more vibrations and things like that to consider. From there, we can start going deeper into solutions. How can we build the systems and services? So <clears throat> not going to stop here for this slide for that long, because we will go this individually through in a second. But that, by knowing the applications, we can start looking at the solutions, and the solutions are usually starting from the components. So the market-specific components and the products that Swayzo can offer for you for hydrogen systems and for other gas systems, but hydrogen in this seminar mainly, are the Swayzo two fittings and the Swayzo high pressure, medium pressure fittings and valves. For the non-high pressure, we will discuss in a second what is high pressure and non-high pressure. We have a lot of different ball valves, pressure regulators, instrumentation valves, measurement devices for pressure flow measurements and hoses. And you should not forget the filters. The filters are very key product um, in any system, but especially in the hydrogen so that we don't create any leaks. The thing that we haven't discussed too much is the welding. So there is always an opportunity of welding a um, tube systems. So you don't need to always use a tube fitting. You might need to also consider welding. The welding is just another element of making um, a, a complex units. And there is different things that you have to consider uh, when, when welding compared to a tube fitting solutions. For this new market or growing market, we're also looking for new product developments where a high pressure is in our suede of world focus right now. As you might understand, hydrogen and high pressure creates a difficulties and we like difficulties. Uh, one of the things that we're working right now is uh, really for aiming for uh, refueling stations. So there's ramp regulator, check valve and actuated valves, uh, three product lines coming more. We have a lot of collaboration with third party suppliers. So I want to mention a few here uh, on the side. So WEH VEH is one of the leading um, refueling nozzle and refueling uh, system manufacturer, uh, especially for the, the, the gases, I mean, the hydrogen gas uh, refueling systems. VICA, very known, well known uh, pressure temperature measurement company, for example, and the Ascroft are some of the com companies we work with, with many of the tubing manufacturers, which are not actually mentioned here. So let's jump to the uh, hydrogen <clears throat> and let's start with the hydrogen production. So hydrogen production in the colorful screen, we considered as a low pressure, as the temperature, uh, sorry, excuse me, the pressures are typically less than um, 30 bars in the electrolyzers and H2 generator world. For that, we can offer you the whole package of our process instrumentation products, including the tube fittings and the valves and so on. But then some of the other more specific uh, solutions are like a prep sampling. So you might need to know what type of a gas you have or what type of a gas you produce. So then the crap sampling is something that you can use for taking a sample. You bring the sample to the laboratory and analyze what is the end product that you are producing. For that, you might need a gas distribution solutions, regulators and other solutions like that. And you might need to have an online quality monitoring, which then needs maybe analyzer panel. And we can help you with system design training and evaluation services. From the product standpoint, I want to highlight again <clears throat> mono um, as a material for oxygen and light applications. So that's something you really have to think 
when, when speaking of the electrolysis um, and H2 generators. Other products are tube fittings, regulators, uh, instrumentation of valve solutions, and the filters, for example. Then a, distrib a distribution. We consider that uh, also as a low pressure when we are speaking around these 100 bar systems. And that's still a, a rather low pressure. For these applications, you might need things like switching panels to switch the flow to be distributed uh, in a different places for storage. A pressure control. So you will need to know how much pressure you have so there's no overpressure or you need to reduce the pressure. Venting and disposal, you might need to be able to vent lines <clears throat> and, and keep them um, uh, or able to dispose of the, the excess gases or so. You need to monitor the, the online quality, not the online quality, but the quality online. <laughs> so the gas quality, not the internet quality, the, the gas quality. And again, to um, make sure that the analyzers work right, the crack sampling, which brings you again to the analyzer panels and training to system designs and so on. The one thing to, to highlight here is also the fuel cell test stands. So there might be a need to test if the fuel cell stacks are working correctly. So there's an opportunity over there to create these test stacks and stands for you. The distribution is also considered um, well, I already mentioned it's considered a low pressure because it's under 100 bar usually. So the materials and the sizes, they are uh, less than two inches. And now maybe a, a brief stop here on the sizes. So when we speak instrumentation and the sizes of instrumentation, we mean always a um, metric tubing to be, for example, exact 12 millimeters or 16 millimeters, 6 millimeters, it's the outside diameter of the tubing. In the inch world, we call it as a fractional world. That's a, a thing that you have to be also knowledgeable. One of the biggest common mistake is to speak about nominal size tubing. An example of that is a nominal size half of inch tubing. The outside diameter is 21.3 millimeters. When we are uh, speaking of, of um, fractional tubing, half a uh, half inch, that's 12.7 millimeters. So be careful with these uh, tubing sizes so that the, the components that you select. Some background noise coming up. Can you please mute it? Thank you. <clears throat> then we move to high pressure wall of refueling and the storaging. So you might have a virtual pipeline needs, refueling stations and mobile uh, refuelers and storage uh, tanks that require higher pressures, starting from the 500 bars up to the thousands of bars of um, hydrogen to be storage. So there again, the solutions are the gas distribution, priority panels to control, and we will look into the priority panels here in a second. And again, you need to do some uh, analysis of the gases. So online quality monitoring, wrap sampling, and then the panels for this all. <clears throat> we can also create you a CNC uh, two-pended solutions. So depending how much you need, for example, a, a uh, pended tubing when creating a, a uh, storage tank racks and, and things like that. So this brings now another element, which is the high pressure solutions. The high pressure solutions are here on the right hand side. We are talking about FK fittings and the FK fitting based products such as ball valves and the needle valves. Deeply, a little bit brief, briefly and deeper in these products in a second. The same effect on the mobility side, not to stop here too much, but you have to have a pressure tanks and the racks for the trucks, buses, whatever the system is that is moving. <clears throat> and the same type of solutions, maybe more of these uh, CNC pended tubing is used on these solutions. 
And this now brings us, now when we know the applications, we need to know your needs, back to the individual components. And we will start from the, I would say, a little bit older fitting technology. Not that there's nothing wrong, but this is uh, widely used in the hydrogen world. Uh, and the fitting technology is called as a cone and thread. Cone and thread meaning that you have to make a cone on the tubing and a thread to a tubing. So with the cone, it creates a sealing surface with the tube fitting itself. And with the threads, you will insert this um, collars <clears throat> onto the tubing where then a gland drives with the collar the tube fitting to meet the tube fitting. We offer this product, we call it as an IPT series, but a word of, I wouldn't say caution, but the knowledge is that there is no international standard between the different cone and thread fitting manufacturers. And every company creates their own standards where a cones and bodies vary from uh, 57 degrees to 63 degrees. Why is this a challenge? Well, if you have a one manufacturer's body and a second manufacturer's um, tubing and they try to meet, the primary seal surface might be super thin and the leak paths might be, <clears throat> might be um, happening much more easily. So a risk, uh, risk uh, management uh, thinking. Also, you need a special tools and special training to be used these tools when you make the cone and a thread. Again, when you make a cone, that's a step number one. To make a thread, it's a step, step number two. So you have to have a, a set of tools to make the, the connections. This is a very susceptible to vibration failures as um, as uh, things might be moving and you always have a vibration and vibration can be also temperature changes. Um, for example, last week here in Finland, it was nighttime, it was um, minus 10 and now it's plus 18 or so whatever, it's outside temperature. So wide range of temperatures happening. And also you need to have a crease to create seal. So we started the a presentation with oxygen hazards and one of the things was the crease and the lubricants. So be careful when using these or uh, pay attention when using this type of a fitting for these different gases so that the, the crease that you use is suitable for the gas the system that you're building. Well, that brings us to the switch of fitting solutions. <clears throat> so 1947, when Fred Lennon founded the company, the product was the switch of tube fitting, which I here refer as a standard tube fitting, which is assembly by turns. So you take your tubing, you cut it off, you insert the tubing into the tube fitting body, and you rotate the nut one full turn and a quarter, and then your fitting is ready to be used. The connection is done, and it can reach up to 760 bars of pressure. Now, depending on the used tubing. So the pressure rating of a switch of tube fitting is only real or it's very much related on the tube um, wall thickness that you're using. A few years ago, as I explained, the clean energy was heavily looking into the CNG solutions and the car manufacturing side of it, for example. So then a car manufacturers needed to have a right, a reliable um, checkpoints when they produce a car. So then we brought up to the market an APT fitting, which is assembly by torque. Assembly by torque instead of assembly by turns. The APT fitting is based on the switch of standard tube fitting. The difference is the APT fitting not has a feature that allows you to use a torque wrench. And I will show that in a second as well. But now when the pressures are going higher and higher, <clears throat> we've introduced the FK medium pressure fitting, I think something like five, six years ago, 
and the FK medium pressure fitting is um, designed for hydrogen and it's suitable for 1378 bar application. That's an equation for 200, uh, excuse me, 20,000 psi pressures. And this fitting can be assembled by torque or a turn. So let's look more deeply in a fitting solution starting from the standard tube fitting. So why is the Schweitzer tube fitting so good? So there is three elements that we want to have from the tube fitting. One, the tube grip. So the tube uh, fitting can hold from the tubing so that the tubing doesn't get, um, they call it as a blowout situation where the tube flies out from the fitting if that would um, occur. Then you need to have a gas seal. We don't want any gases, but not especially the hydrogen to leak through from the fitting. So the front ferrule creates the sealing with the uh, fitting uh, body and the front ferrule surface and the tubing surface. And then the third one is the vibration protection. So every machine has a little bit of vibration. So if you have vibration and the tube solutions are vibrating, they start to leak over the time. So that's something we want to eliminate. <clears throat> and the back ferrule of a Swedish tube fitting, the design and the materials are creating the vibration protection together with the front ferrule on the body. So how do we achieve this vibration and the tube grip? So we patented uh, around two decades ago, this SAT-12 surface carbonation technology where an outside surface of a back ferrule is hard as a tool steel, but the internals of the back ferrule are still soft like a normal standard stainless steel. So that gives you kind of a flexibility um, and um, wear resistance and ductility is still there. The back ferrules are around four days in this special oven type of a system where a carbonization is being done. I spoke a little bit already of the APT fitting. This is just the illustration. So we have the standard fitting body and then we have the uh, nut that has this APT dynamic zone. And what that zone makes is that when you have pulled up the fitting correctly, there's no cap. And if there's a cap, you need to do a little bit more additional tightening. And that tightening can be measured with the torque wrench. And then a little bit more deep dive to the FK fitting technology. So the de design for hydrogen fitting for higher pressures. Again, <clears throat> For the cone and thread fitting, you need to have a, a specific tools, specific skill set to be able to make the cone and thread fitting. So what we wanted to bring to the market is the ease of assembly. So, but not to get away from the reliable leak that installation. So with the FK fitting, you still get a gas seal, you get a vibration resistance, and a tube curve, similar to switch of tube fitting, but it's easy to assemble and no special tools are required. So let's see how it works. <clears throat> On a cone and thread fitting, you need it to create for a tubing the cone and the thread. On the FK fitting solution, you don't need to do it. You cut the tubing and you remove the excess and internal burrs away from the uh, surfaces, and then you do the assembly either by the torque wrench or a assembly by terms, as already mentioned. So we have a front ferrule and a back ferrule. The front ferrule <coughs> creates the ceiling, creates the ceiling with the uh, fitting body and the tubing surface, and then the back ferrule and the front ferrule nose creates the tube creep, so the blowout situation cannot happen for your high pressure applications. What the fitting brings you as a technology is that it reduces your installation cost. It's 
approximately five times faster to assemble than a Conan thread connection. Now that depends, of course, on the operator's skill set, but still it takes a lot of time to make a cone and a thread. Where this doesn't require other than the common tools and it's simple assembly. And it's also reliable to install and inspect before the system usage. I will not speak too much about the product test reports, but <clears throat> it goes through all of our product lines. So we test the materials and the products before we bring them to the market. There's a lot of different type of product tests available if you want to take a look on those. But now when we have looked on one of the most important component in the tube fitting or the tube, um, tubing system, which is the tube fitting and a connection of the tubing and a fitting. Let's jump to the valves. As we mentioned, the valves are very important and that's a one area as <clears throat> which we as a manufacturer can affect. So how we create a seal here between the ball and the um, uh, seed, for example. So that's the outside diameter and then what type of a seat loading mechanism a manufacturer can create so that the seat is always pushed together um, and against the ball. And then <clears throat> the second, second thing that is very important is the stem sealing. So every valve has a stem. The stem rotates the ball or moves the needle up and down. So you need to have the sealings always on the stem and against the ball, if it's a ball valve. Uh, two different leak pads are the two most common leak pads. One, the valve leaks through, so it doesn't stop the flow as it's been designed to do. Always remember that the ball valves are to be used either closed or in a fully open position, not in between. It's not a flow regulating valve. It's an open, closed type of a valve, shut off valve. The second leak mechanism always with the valve, no matter who manufactures the valve, is the stem leakage. So the stem, when it, that moves, it starts to leak <clears throat> and creates the leak path from the stem. The third thing is the connection. So you always need to connect the valve product somehow to the tubing line, either by using a fitting technology or a threads. So that's the third leak path that usually happens on the valves. So then by knowing your application, we can start offering you different type of valve solutions, which might or include 60 series ball valve, for example. This is designed for a little, little bit larger and different pressure ratings than the previous AFS ball valve, for example. That's why we always ask you three things, the pressure, the temperature and the flow. So we can help you to select the right valve to, a, uh, to your solution. For the higher pressure solutions, we have introduced this ball valve called FKB, meaning that it, it holds the 1378 bar solutions. It comes in a two way and a three way valve where the difference with, between the two-way valve, it's only for shut off. The three-way valve is usually for directing the flow either to the left or a right. The beauty on this valve is again the stem sealing. So super reliable valve and also the uh, ball sealing. So how we have designed this direct load design so that the seeds are pushing against the ball so it doesn't leak through. Then on top of the ball valves, which are to stop the flow, you need more or less a product that can adjust the flow. For the flow adjustments, you might need a needle valve. <clears throat> I have here an IPT series needle valve uh, for presentation purposes. The thing with the IP or the, the needle valves that you have to understand is how the sealing mechanism 
is uh, located against the, the threads. The threads on the stems are moving the stem up and down. And the ceiling might be at the top of the threads or below the threads. If the, the ceiling is below the threads, then the system media cannot touch on the threads. So then the lubrication on the threads is not that significant. But if the threads are touching the media, then you have to also consider what type of uh, lubricant the, the, the threads are having. These can be also automated, so they can go uh, up and down and closed by automation. <clears throat> One other example of a product that is being needed in this uh, most common systems is a check valve. With the check valve, you want to limit the uh, flow or a pressure to go in the wrong direction. So it's a directional valve that limits the flow to go to uh, the wrong, wrong side or prevent the gases to mix, for example. I'm not going to discuss too much of welding. But as I said, welding should be also considered in some applications to be very reliable connection method. Then here at the end of the presentation, I want to show you a few examples of a hydrogen infrastructure and applications that <clears throat> our colleagues around the world have created. And this is now for our uh, a refueling system as that could be very common for most of you to, to, uh, to rely. So on the refueling systems, uh, what we have done are priority panels, the dispensers and the storage systems around the compression and separation. Uh, and to show a few applications on those using the FK solution is, for example, the dispenser application. So I, I'm not sure how much you know about the hydrogen refueling, but the car itself that comes to the station and starts to refuel, that actually speaks with the refueling unit itself. Because the pressure and the temperature of a car's or a system's tanks is speaking back to the refueling system. And the refuel gas cars, also the CNG or hydrogen cars, you usually do it in a three phases. So you have in a hydrogen world, you have around 350 bars as a first stage, then around 500 bars as a second stage, and then the 750 if that's the, the application as a third stage. For the dispensers, <clears throat> we have um, FK ball valves and the needle valves controlling the flow uh, when the, the dispensing happens. So when you're beginning the refueling, you connect the nozzle in the car, the valves are opening, and when you release the, uh, the nozzle, the pressure between the nozzle and the hose needs to be pushed back to the station, so it's safe to release. And to get the, the pressures from zero to 700 floors in a car, you need to have these priority panels where you have different stages to fill the car with the hydrogen, and that is used mainly for uh, the storage tanks to be refilled and repressurized fast again at the, <clears throat> the station site. So then when the next car comes in, the refueling can start right away. The refueling of a 700 bar system takes around five minutes. All right. Then during the presentation, I was showing the four different um, applications and underneath the applications, we have different design and assembly services for your use. So we can help you with crap sampling solutions. These are catalog ready products, but as our vision is saying, we want to understand your needs. So we usually discuss with you before just giving you a catalog part number so that the systems, whether it's a crap sampling, mechanical seal support or a gas distribution, or analytical subsystem that it works as you need the thing to work. For that, we can also build things for you. So we call our service as custom solutions. So we design with you and then we build things and test things uh, for you 
so that they are functionally ready to be installed as a part of your solution. Something that <clears throat> you might be interested in, if there's a lot of pending needs in your system is the CNC2 pending, which we can offer you so you get the uh, reliable, consistent pending tubing uh, for your applications. Our field engineer group can come to your site and do an evaluation. We can check your hoses, your whole systems, search leaks from there and, and help you identify any of the risks and, and build a uh, report out for that. So your maintenance team, so we can help you to maintain the, the systems. And to achieve your team's knowledge, we also train and educate your teams how to use these products, how to select the right components and other topics. As mentioned already, we have a field engineering team, um, almost uh, over 40 people at least today, only focus in the clean energy sites here in the EMEA, Europe, Middle East, Africa um, region. The freight, so one of the core values was the quality. So all of our products are <clears throat> um, guaranteed for uh, for life. So Swedish limited lifetime warranty applies on every product that we bring to the market and also for our custom solution assemblies. So you can rely on our products. And we want to do things right. So there was on the second slide, I think, uh, quite a bit of the recycling numbers, ESG numbers and, and things like that. With that, I thank you with the attention, and now it's time for any of the questions you might have uh, for the end of the presentation. And you might may use um, raise the hand feature or send the uh, questions on the on the chat. So I think it was Ulf was the first one uh, raising the hand. So please, you can open up the mic and. Yes, hello. Thanks hello. for the thanks for the presentation. First of all, and um, I have a question related to hazardous area classification. Do you have any any material available about um, leakage rates of Swagelok fittings, for example? If I heard your um, question right, so you were asking if there's any materials for Swagelok uh, leakage. Yeah. So, we we have a um, sorry I lost the word here. We we have a, a product or not the product. We have catalogs called product test reports. So now depending are you looking for a a tube fitting uh, leak rates or a valve um, a specific valves, we we can help you with that um, with the product test reports. We have um this tool. <clears throat> I will bring it up to the screen as well. Called electronic desktop reference. Um, I hope you can see it. So um, some of the product test reports are available through this tool, and I think there is some available on the Swedish.com as well. But if you have a specific product need, you can send an um, email to me or Sami, for example, and we can help you. That was an excellent question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And um, then I think, was it Alexei? Yes, hello, Alexei is from uh, Linde, Northern Europe. I have uh, oh. two questions. Uh, uh, first, thanks for the presentation, it was very interesting. Uh, my question is about um, automatic uh, needle valves from Swedgelock. We've integrated actuators. Do you have something like that? And the second question was about uh, ATEX uh, certification for your uh, products. Uh, as I understand, all the measurement devices uh, must be ATEX uh, in, in these applications. Uh, what, what is your experience with that? Hmm? Yes, thank you. Very, very good questions. So let's answer for the first one, uh, which was the, the um, uh, automation of the needle valves. So um, maybe I show uh, quickly on the catalog, not to go in any specific uh, specifics here, but to give you a little idea on the, the, the needle valves and the, the catalogs. Um, I'll just bring up one example. So 
this is now a N series needle valve where you can have either air actuated um, air actuated actuators for needle valves, or then we can use a third party supplier, which we are usually using a um, company called Gulex. That's uh, is that the Swiss company summit? Yeah, it's a Swiss based company where they put a electric actuator on top of the, the, the needle valve. One thing to remember on the needle valves and the actuators is that <clears throat> normally the needle valves is rotating to close. If you are using a uh, pneumatic actuator on a needle valve, it actually goes just up and down. There is no flow control. On the electrical actuator, you can create a flow control. But then one thing to consider is always this um, um, uh, fail to save mode of a electric actuator. So that's one, one key element too. Um, and that then leads us to your second portion of the questions was the ATEX approvals. So now we as a manufacturer, we have an ATEX compliance for all the manual products. Then if a uh, needle valve, for example, needs to be ATEX approved, uh, then we don't certify the actuator unless it's made by switch of like this electric, act oh, sorry, the, the pneumatic actuator, then we certify that whole package. But then if a Gulex manufactures a needle valve package for us, they certify the package to be ATEX approved, which means the, the electric actuator. That also applies to a measurement devices that you were referring. So pressure gauges, for example, if they have any electronics in them, so the electronic components need to be um, um, ATEX approved so that there is no risk of, of um, sparks happening. So the ball valves, <coughs> ball valves are one of the key things. Uh, I just bring up one image here. So if you have a ball valve where you have an air actuator, so that has to be considered as an ATEX approved product if a product goes to a ATEX area. And it always starts at where the product is going to be used. So if the product or the, the system area is ATEX area, then a product needs to be complied. Again, actuated valves need to be ATEX approved. Uh, manual valves are ATEX compliant. Sorry, that was a little bit long answer. Thank you. Everything clear? Great, great questions. Um, were there any questions on the chat? There's one. There's one question. Uh, Peteris is asking, could you elaborate on monel material for light prone solutions? Are there significant advantage over uh, 316L? Um, I don't have the material right now available for you. Um, that's something we can uh, look more into. We have this material selection um, program that looks in the specific chemicals and the materials and what are the suitable um, combinations to be used. So um, to, I, I don't have um, right now, but there is a, a better answer for you. Monel was a referred material for light, but I know it. I, I believe it depends on the um, the solution. How you know, and the um, what's the right term here? Um, how how strong light might be. And Thomas uh, is sending a question. Uh, can you have a look at the question? Okay, yeah, Q and A. Yeah, sorry. That was my question. I was not really. Yes, there's a lot of questions. Can you please share the presentation? Yes, we will share the presentation. <clears throat> and um, the second question is uh, 316, 316L also good for welded applications above two inches. Um, now that depends on, on the welding. You have to consider who is welding and what type of heat codes are you welding together and are you just welding two pipes together or tubes together? So I would say definitely yes, there's a lot of applications where 360 can be welded 
but are you welding, for example, a valve into a tube solution? I'm not seeing any issues. Why not? But um, maybe, yeah, I, maybe we have to discuss that, Thomas, uh, more in depth together. Yes, and, uh, uh, I was looking at uh, uh, higher sized uh, pipings where welded well, ne well neck flanges are uh, welded to pipes or uh, in high pressure applications, maybe even the valves are welded, welded ended valves are welded directly to uh, piping. So uh, for high pressure, um, high size applications also of for hydrogen is uh, SS316 or 316L still good? Uh, yeah, I would say yes. Um, I don't have that much of knowledge on the higher size than two inches as <clears throat> our product range ends in two inches, uh, but I'm not seeing any major uh, challenges. The things do apply similarly to them to the larger size tubing or piping than on the, the instrumentation side. So the permeation, for example, and then the material so that the stainless steel that you're using has enough chromium and nickel, for example, so that there is no hydrogen embrittlement happening. Uh, the higher pressures always needs also um, a thicker wall thicknesses. So that's a one thing that needs to be considered on those uh, larger applications. But unfortunately, I'm not a, a specialist on these larger size products, but I believe there's a manufacturers that make um, bigger size valves, flanges, valve necks, the things that you mentioned. So I'm not seeing any issues on the, on the yes. material itself. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, one more question which I had is the other one. Um, we talked about uh, higher pressure. So uh, what, what is the limit from which we can consider it to be in the high pressure region? Is it above 100 bars or? Yeah, well, that's an excellent question. I would not put any mark on any specific pressure itself, but this is high pressure, this is low pressure. It has to start from the uh, compatible components. So what is the weakest link on the system? As, <clears throat> as we have a, a switch of tube fitting that can easily go up to 760 bars in certain dimensions, not all of them. And that's related to the, the wall thickness of a tubing. So I give you an example, 12 millimeter tubing with 1.5 millimeter wall thickness, the working pressure is 330 bars. But if we take six millimeter tubing with 1.6 millimeter wall thickness, the working pressure is 790 bars. So same tube fitting technology applies, but one is 300 something and other one is close to 800 bars application. And that's only the, the connection of a product. Now, what type of a valve can be utilized for 800 bars? So then that could be the weakest link is the, the next component in the line. Okay, thank so you. Thank you, that is nice. To be looked. You're welcome. Yeah. I think there was a, was it to Thomas or is this the same question? What is the lower limit for considers higher pressure? Yeah, okay, that's the same, okay. Is there any other questions? I will end the recording here. Um,